Hello, Mr. McKenzie. How are my tests? <clears throat> Gallbladder, wrong fish. Mr. Van Landel. Good afternoon, Mr. Van Landel. Can you hear me, Mr. Van Landel? Hi. Who are you? I'm Dex Shiflet, paralawyer. You haven't talked to any insurance companies, have you? No. Good. Don't talk to them because they're just out to screw you. Do you have a lawyer? No. My firm handles more car wrecks than anybody in Memphis. Insurance companies are terrified of us, and we don't charge a dime. Can you wait till my wife gets back? Your wife, Mr. Van No! Uh, sorry. One of the big no-nos in this scene, obviously, is them fictionally portraying uh, ambulance chasing and, that, and fulfilling that stereotype. Directly soliciting potential clients, which is a huge no-no and unethical, and probably going to get you suspended, if not outright disbarred, in every jurisdiction. But the bigger thing here that you might not be aware of just from watching this scene are there are ethical rules that prohibit promising or misleading potential clients, especially with information that's impossible to objectively verify. So these kinds of offhanded comments about all the insurance companies are terrified of us or we don't charge money, you know, these things are not even true or can't be verified. I'm sure the law firm is going to want a fee, right, a contingency fee, so they are charging money in some respects. Very sorry, Mr. Van Landen. Very sorry. Uh, where is your wife, Mr. Van Landen? She'll be back in a little while. Well, I'm going to have to talk to her down in my office because there's a ton of information that I need. Hey, yeah, just sign right there. Now, remember, don't talk to anybody except your doctor. There are going to be people coming at you from every direction, offering you settlements. I do not want you, under any circumstance, to sign anything without me reviewing it first. You understand? My number is on this card. You can call me 24 hours a day. Mr. Rudy Baylor's number is on the back. You call that number for him anytime, okay? Do you have any questions? No. Good. We're going to get you a bunch of money. There's a huge problem in this scene that can all be fitting under the same umbrella here, which is a tendency to overpromise in an unethical manner. So there, it's never appropriate for a lawyer to guarantee the outcome of a case. I don't care what the case is. Nobody's got a crystal ball under their desk, and so they can't know with certainty. What we do as lawyers is we educate our clients on risks and benefits. And it's more appropriate to do that much further along in a case after it's had time to develop and mature and you've collected a lot of evidence, you've secured expert witnesses, and you have a better appreciation of what the likely outcome would be were you to try the case instead of settling or something like that. But, you know, somebody who's just been in an accident, even in this fictional portrayal, they have no idea what his actual injuries are. You can surmise there's some lower and upper extremity stuff, maybe a traumatic brain injury, but you have no idea. You have no idea what the insurance coverage is. You have no idea about liability. You have no idea what you're talking about, if, and you're talking out of, out of turn if you're promising people that they're going to get boatloads of money. So this scene is wrong for 150 reasons. You could probably dedicate an entire legal ethics video to it. Where is Mr. Stone? Honestly, Your Honor, I, I, I don't know. I, he was supposed to meet me here, and, and I don't know where he is. Well, why doesn't that surprise me? So what do you want? You want a continuance? No, Your Honor. I am prepared to argue this motion. Are you a lawyer? Well, I just, I just passed the bar, and uh, these are my clients. Uh, Mr. Stone filed this on my behalf until I pass the bar. Well, you got a hell of a lot of nerve walking into my courtroom without a license. Now get the hell out of here, get no license, and then you come back. The biggest consideration that any law student should have being in a courtroom and speaking on the record is the un unauthorized practice of law. So until you've actually passed the bar and been sworn in, you're not technically eligible to practice law. And practicing law can encompass a lot of things that you might not assume are actual practicing of law, like in this scenario. There's a case with a motion that's pending to be heard. You've got the defense counsel sitting on one side, the judge is taking the bench, and now you've got someone basically holding themselves out and saying, hey, I'm, I'm here to argue this, even though technically uh, I'm not eligible to. Now, if you watch the full movie, you can appreciate that really the only thing standing in the way was Rudy, Matt Damon's character, getting sworn in, and that's something that could be handled in pretty short order. All these boss claims under... There must be a hundred years of legal experience gathered around the table. My staff has flunked the bar exam six times. Now, Rudy, don't be intimidated by all these boys on this side of the table. I guarantee you get them on a golf course, they fold like a cheap suit. <laughs> let's see, let's see what we got here. 
I think maybe it's uh, uh, appropriate to start with the uh, corporate designee. What we're looking at here is Rudy Baylor has traveled to the basically either the, this big law firm's office or maybe it's the corporate office of the insurance company, but the point is still the same. He's going on the defense's turf to conduct depositions of certain material witnesses and the insurance company defendant here through a corporate designee. I don't think there's any time in your career where you have a situation like this and it's comfortable. Uh, that's not to say that you're nervous, but it's not comfortable when you're on the other side's turf. And more often than not, depositions are taken on neutral grounds, maybe even at a court reporter's office. So rare is the case where you're going to be sitting in the defense lawyer's office um, doing depot after depot after depot. I mean, maybe it happens once or twice in a case, but you don't need to do it for every deposit, uh, excuse me, every witness. But there's something else going on here, which is the messaging, right? Which is that the other side has strength in numbers, strength in experience, wisdom. And even though it's Rudy being there to take uh, depositions for the plaintiff, his client, the defense is kind of steering how it's going to unfold. And I think we're about to see here, Rudy, Rudy starts to take back a little control. And uh, good on him for doing that. Jack Underhall here. Right, yeah. I, I don't think so. I beg your pardon. Well, you heard me. I, I wanted to start with uh, Jackie Lemanchik, the claims handler. I think it's best we start with Mr. Underhall. All due respect, Mr. Drummond, this is my deposition. I'm going to call these witnesses in the order in which I see fit. So I'd like to start with Jackie Lemanchik. Let's pause again for a minute. You know, in this scene, they're trying to fit a lot in, in one, one thing, which I understand. But the reality is each witness is like a separate and distinct deposition. And it does happen where you stack multiple depositions in a day. For me personally, never more than two because of all the prep work that goes involved. But in this scene, they're trying to portray that Matt Damon showed up to this office ready to take what seems like half a dozen depositions, which is not advisable uh, from the lawyer because you're probably not going to be as effective. Now, the, the second thing is here... You want to do the, your part to try and ensure that the witness is actually going to appear at the deposition, and you don't want to rely on the other side to produce them. Now, it's a little different with a corporation, because if a corporation has counsel and you've properly served a 30B6 notice or in Florida a Rule 1.310B6 notice, then the defendant has got to show up and appear. But what we're talking about here, Jackie Lemanchik, other like former employees of this, corporate, of this corporation, Matt Damon's lawyer should have had these people under subpoena. And if he couldn't find them, he should have hired an investigator to find them first and then get them under subpoena because no judge is going to have sympathy on a, oh, I just thought this person would show up. Well, why? There's no evidence, even in this scene, that John Voigt's character, the lead defense lawyer, uh, told Matt Damon, hey, yeah, Jackie Lemanchik, we'll, we'll go find her even though she's a former employer. Right, so this whole surprise element, Jackie Lemanchik's gone, nobody knows where she is. It looks good in the movie, but it's very unrealistic in real life unless Matt Damon was truly just not being diligent and thorough. One of the things here, too, to appreciate is that Jackie Lemanchik and other individuals, right, these are individual witnesses. So when you go to depose them, they don't really know in advance what you're going to ask them, nor does the other side. With a corporation, and you heard John Voight's character say, oh, well, maybe we should begin with the designee. It's different. We actually have to give corporate defendants or entity defendants advance notice of topics with sufficient specificity to apprise them of what the hell we're going to ask them about. And it might seem unfair. Why do you have to disclose in advance? But I think it's a huge advantage for us because we give them a sufficient explanation up front of say, hey, this is what we intend to ask you about. Now the corporation has a duty to prepare adequately and thoroughly and actually present one or more designees who it basically acknowledges, hey, I'm going to have this random person show up, but whatever he or she, uh, she says in response to your questions, that binds us as the corporation. It's a, it's a very powerful tool, but there is that subtle distinction. Maybe we should just go call the judge. And... Oh, I don't believe we have to get pugilistic this time in the morning. <laughs> I'm not meaning to be pugilistic. We're simply having a little problem with the... Uh... Jackie Lemanchik, uh, this Polish woman. What sort of problem? She doesn't work here anymore. Was she fired? She resigned. She resigned. Um, well, where is she now? Well, she is no longer working for our client, and uh, we can't produce her as a witness, so let's move along. All right, Russell Crockett. 
Anybody in the room named Russell Crockett? He's gone too. He's downsized. Downsized. And what a coincidence. Uh, Client is going through a periodic downsizing. Yeah, well, that will happen, won't it? So this is a, a really, I think, a pretty accurate scene. So this is true. If a corporation no longer employs someone and they're not represented by the same counsel, then John Voight's character is right. They're under no obligation to produce that witness. And that gets back to my earlier point that Matt Damon really should have been thorough and diligent and actually found this out in advance and, if necessary, subpoenaed the non-party witness, in this case, Jackie Lemanchik. But I want to talk more broadly about former employees because, believe it or not, when you're suing corporations, especially larger corporations, for any number of reasons, including those that are very legitimate, just natural turnover and career progression, you know, the same person who was the store manager one day, let's say, in a slip and fall who watched it, may not be there six to nine months later when you're in litigation trying to take depositions. Now, believe me, there have been plenty of cases against some corporations that I can think of in my mind where employees are no longer there, and I don't, I don't think it's always with the best of intentions. I, it feels all too convenient. But even assuming good faith across the board here, when there is a former employee that is no longer uh, represented by that law firm, you know, there are ethics opinions. I could think of one in Florida, for example. I think it was back in the late 80s where the Florida Bar wrote the ethics opinion. Matt Damon's character in this example, the plaintiff's lawyer, is not required to go get permission from the defense corporation or their lawyers, you know, to say, hey, can I go talk to your former employee? They're allowed to go do that as long as there's no evidence that they're still represented. And that's what Matt Damon should have done. I'm not saying he couldn't have taken Jackie Lemanchik's depot or shouldn't, but in a situation like this, you use other discovery tools before a deposition. This whole element of Matt Damon being surprised and having no idea where Jackie Lemanchik is and acting shocked, you know, the more thorough approach to this is you file a lawsuit and one of the first things you do is you serve interrogatories. Interrogatories are a written request for the other side to answer under oath. And one of the questions you could have asked is identify all the people who have information about this case and whether or not they're still employed. And if they're not employed, when did they leave? What were the circumstances? Why? What was the time period? And what's their last known contact information. Had Matt Damon done that, let's say, three months before this scene takes place where he wants to depose Jackie Lemanchik, he might have known that she was no longer employed, could have sent out an investigator, spoke to her, and almost got all this stuff off the record and then decided, hey, maybe I don't need to depose her, or maybe I do. So there's a lot to unpack here, but this, this does accurately represent some issues that come up often in litigation. Hey. For bugs? But let's live in the world of Rainmaker here, and let's assume, God forbid, that you had a good faith belief to believe that the defendant or their counsel is surveilling you or surreptitiously recording things in your, con you know, look, attorney-client privilege is sacrosanct. I don't care what jurisdiction you're in. There's probably ethics opinions, Supreme Court opinions, statutes on point, all of, all of which are saying the same thing, that a lawyer should be able to communicate with his or her client or clients uh, in a confidential manner without having the whole world, let alone the opposing party, have access to it. And there are so many different steps you could take to protect it. But in, this, in a case like this, in a situation like this, they brought in what appears to be someone with some expertise. If he actually found some things, first thing I'd be doing is going to the judge and asking for a whole slew of sanctions. And now, look, you're looking for sanctions in the case to help benefit your client and remedy the situa situation immediately. But I guarantee you, if this were true, this wouldn't end there. It would end up going to the bar, probably going up to the Supreme Court or whatever governing body controls lawyers. And the lawyers that were involved there would almost certainly be disbarred. Please state your name for the record. Mrs. Marverine Black. Now, Mrs. Black, you are the mother of Donnie Ray Black, who recently died of acute myosolytic leukemia because the defendant great benefit... Objection. Leading. Sustained. Your son, Donnie Ray, needed an Objection. operation... Leading. Sustained. Mrs. Black, did you purchase this medical policy because you were concerned about medical care Objection. for your son? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Leading. This is a really accurate portrayal, I think, of how some trials, or at least portions of trials, 
take place. When you, as the plaintiff's lawyer, are calling a witness, the presumption is that they're going to be favorable for you, and they're not adverse or hostile for you. And so the law basically says you're under an obligation to ask that witness open-ended questions. You're there to be a conduit for the witness to just simply explain what they heard, saw, felt, et cetera, and let the jury come to their own conclusions and weigh that evidence. You are not supposed to be feeding a witness answers or asking questions in a manner that are almost giving the conclusion or the answer within them. That's a leading question, which is why you see John Voight's character twice correctly object that Matt Damon is leading his own witness. Now, if this were, that's, this is a direct examination. This is a lawyer asking questions of a witness that he has called for his own case, his client's case in chief. If this were a defense witness and Matt Damon were asking questions, the irony is he should be doing nothing but asking leading questions because the law per permits it and it's a good way to control the adverse or hostile witness who's on the stand. So that it's an interesting dynamic here. But I think what you're also seeing is an inexperienced lawyer not knowing any better. Even if in law school and during some evidence course or trial advocacy course, you know, Rudy Baylor's character in this movie was, was taught not, hey, don't lead witnesses on direct examination. It can be hard for a lot of newer lawyers who have not tried cases before to avoid leading questions because you know in your mind what you want the witness to say or hope he or she will say, and you're trying to almost feed them the answer, but you got to really... You've got to stop. You don't, you, the witness should be the star of the show at this point, not the lawyer. And so John Voight's character was correct, and the judge's rulings, in my estimation, were correct as well. Mrs. Black, is this not uh, Dr. Page's uh, letterhead? And at the bottom there, uh, is, that's not his signature. He can't do that. Yes, it is. And is this Why? letter not addressed? He can't introduce me? evidence that way. Plus, it's hearsay. Yes, sir. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, uh, a letter from. from the Black's family physician to Mr. Drummond is inadmissible. That is quite correct, Your Honor. And I'm not asking for this letter to be admitted into evidence. I'm simply asking that this witness be allowed to read the letter under Rule 612 of the Tennessee Rules of Evidence so her recollection can be refreshed, that's all. Mr. Baylor, what do you say? Uh, I, d I don't know, Your Honor. I just object to this. And, and also, we were not furnished this letter in, in pretrial discovery. What do you say to that, Mr. Drummond? Your Honor, I had no idea this letter be needed. I expect this lady to tell the truth about what her doctor told her. Anything else, Mr. Baylor? No. There's a few things. This is cross-examination. John Voight's character is asking questions of a presumptively hostile witness to his case because it was one of the plaintiff's witnesses. Uh, Matt Damon's character here when he stands up and says objection and he starts explaining, that's what we call a speaking objection and I've never met a judge who likes it and most of which won't even tolerate it. They want you to say, stand up, address the court and say objection and then immediately provide the legal basis, which here he wanted to say was hearsay. So it should have just been objection, hearsay. Give the judge an opportunity to rule. Hearsay is a very common evidentiary issue that comes up. It's hardly a novel thing and the judge is probably listening the same way Matt Damon's character was and would have been able to rule immediately. But giving the judge all this legal argument and then John Voight giving all the legal argument to rebut him in front of the jury, this is the kind of thing that judges frown upon. They want to keep control of the case. Let me say something else here. Matt Damon is trying this case solo. He's, he's got no second chair, which is what we call like a, another lawyer, a member of the team who's going to help try the case. I don't recommend that at all, and if you can avoid it, even if you're a solo practitioner and you get to the point where you have to try a case, reach out to a colleague or a friend who can come try a case. Between note-taking and memory and taking notes about what the jury's doing and, and legal rulings that took place, it's, it's nearly impossible to be as effective as you should be for your client if you're trying a case by yourself, criminal or civil. And I've tried both, so I, I don't think this is advisable. Now, Rudy's character has Danny DeVito sitting behind him, a, a para lawyer, which again is not a thing. but. So I guess they're trying to portray that he does have some help. But let me talk about the other evidentiary issue here, which is Rule 612. So under the federal rules of evidence, there is a Rule 612, and John Voight's character is referencing a state version of that same rule, and many states have similar rules to the federal government, uh, to the federal rules of evidence, rather. 612 is about refreshing a witness's recollection. Yet again, another very basic, common, you know, way of asking a witness to review a document to um, remember certain information. So this is something that Rudy probably shouldn't have had uh, to scramble for. I think if you look in the scene, him, he's a 6 12 6, and he asked Danny DeVito, who's scrambling looking. It's a little silly because that's like a very basic, straightforward thing. Now, what's interesting for me, I'm looking at this scene, 
John Voight, in my opinion, did not lay the proper predicate to invoke Rule 612, meaning to actually take advantage of the rule, which allows a witness to look at a document that isn't admissible, but for another purpose here, which would be to refresh her recollection. Typically, the lawyer wants to lay the framework where the witness says, look, is there anything that I could show you that would help refresh your recollection about A, B, and C? After you've asked that witness a question and she says, you know, I don't remember, then you follow it up, right? What could I show you to help you remember? Well, I have a document here. That document is from a doctor. You know this doctor. If, let me walk up and show the witness. Take a look at this. Don't tell, what the, don't tell the jury what it says, but take a look at this and let me know when you're done. Okay, I'm done. Does that refresh your recollection about the subject matter we just Yes, it does. Okay, now, and you re-ask the question. So, again, this is like a very common way to get a witness to remember information when they're forgetful. So this whole element of surprise with the Rule of Evidence 612 is a bit unrealistic. State your name for the record. Wilfred Keeley. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Uh, Mr. Keeley, uh, this great benefit brochure, is that you? Is that your name? Yes. And, and what do those initials stand for? CEO. Yeah, what do they stand for? What does CEO mean? Chief Executive Officer. Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, thank you. So, so you're, the, you're, you're, you're the guy. You're the, you're the main guy. You're the cheese. The buck stops with you. You could say that, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, um, I'd like to turn the questioning of Mr. Keeley over to my uh, partner, Rudy Bailey. What are you, out of your mind? You don't have a license. I didn't have a choice. What are you doing? You're late. If you notice the configuration of this courtroom, every courtroom is a little different, you know, the dimensions, the, but the structure, the layout's about the same. And what a, a lot of people may not appreciate is when you've heard the expression, oh, he or she has passed the bar and become a lawyer, it's actually a reference from way back to the layout of the courtroom. That demarcation, the usually a wood paneling wall between the gallery where non-lawyers and, and people unaffiliated with the case sit, and then the people in front of it who are sitting at, you know, we call it counsel table, that's what they call the bar. And so it was just like an expression of saying when you are eligible to practice, you can walk past that threshold. Uh, Danny DeVito's character is not past the bar. He shouldn't be walking around there, let alone talking to witnesses. So he's not only going to wind up probably sanctioned with a permanent injunction to have him never go into a courtroom, but uh, he might even be getting some criminal charges. Has the jury reached a verdict? Yes, we have, Your Honor. Is it written on paper according to my instructions? Yes, sir. Please read the verdict. We, the jury, find for the plaintiff and award actual damages in the amount of $150,000. And we, the jury, Fine for the plaintiff and award punitive damages in the amount of $50 million. There's a few things that this scene makes me think about. Number one is, and I've talked about this with a lot of young lawyers in our firm, the moments before a jury's verdict is published, so here it's a juror doing it. In most jurisdictions, the foreman of the jury will hand it to the judge who hands it to a clerk or bailiff, and they publish it, they read it. God, those, no, those moments are so nerve-wracking. And uh, it's very realistic with the turning of pages. You know, verdicts are often multiple pages, so there's anticipation. Even though you hear, we, we find for the plaintiff, okay, that's a good start, what next? And here's a situation where the first number is low relative to probably what they wanted, 150000 So the defense, that's why the, I think the camera pans over there. It's kind of like they don't want to let it out, but they feel like that's a big win, probably less than they thought. But then you hear the punitive damage amount for $50 million, which I think in this movie was like five times more than Matt Damon's character asked for. I have never had the good fortune for a client of recovering or having a jury give us five times what we asked for. Usually the jury comes back a little less than you ask for or right at it. But... Here's what I want to talk about. There are different types of damages. In most jurisdictions, there's compensatory damages, meaning those damages that are intended to make your client whole. So lost wages, medical bills in the past and the future, pain, suffering, all of the things you know, you've probably heard about before. 
But then separately, in some cases, not all, in some cases you can get punitive damages, where, which are a whole separate category designed not to make the plaintiff whole, but to punish the defendant for such egregious wrong conduct. And the idea being you give all this additional money because it'll deter them from doing the same type of wrong things in the future. It's not hard, excuse me, it's not easy to recover punitive damages. And in most jurisdictions, it's not even easy to get eligible to ask for them. So in Florida, for example, when you file a lawsuit, you can't say from day one, I want compensatory and punitive. No, you start with compensatory, you work up the case, and if it's appropriate, at some point, you can file a motion with the court and ask for permission to amend your pleadings and add punitive damages. And even that's far from a guarantee. And then even if a judge allows you to, you know, usually the burden of the burden of proof, or excuse me, the things that you have to prove at trial in order to substantiate punitive damages, are very challenging. Um, but that that's what you're seeing playing out here: a massive verdict for this company that ultimately goes belly up because of it. At 5 p.m. today, insurance company Great Benefit filed for protection under the bankruptcy code in federal court in Cleveland. Many states are now investigating Great Benefit, and a number of class action lawsuits have been filed. For CNN, Jim Redmond reporting. According to Hello? Rudy, Leo Drummond here. It appears the company's been looted. I'm, I'm sorry, Rudy. I wanted you to get every penny of that money. Everybody loses on this one. Wanted you to know. Thank you, Mr. Drummond. Great benefit is like a bad slot machine. It never pays off. Should have taken 175000 What the hell were we thinking? Just got all twisted, didn't it? This legal profession. This is Rudy's first case and what a remarkable case it was. But he probably made some mistakes on the verge of trial or during trial because I bet you there were some better settlement office offers that he probably should have considered taking. And even if he didn't, after the verdict came back, he still should have been trying to resolve the case to avoid any delay through appeals, or in this case, where they end up going belly up. So you got to always keep your clients interested, top of mind. Look, I, I would say that for Rudy's first case, this was, uh, I mean, it's like a 7 out of 10. I mean, the, the result is a 12 out of 10. I'd say his legal performance was a 7 out of 10 because it's hard to knock someone too much for not knowing the rules of evidence cold when it's their first case, when the outcome says that they obviously kicked ass. So uh, this is one of my favorite legal movies because it gives you enough insight into what actually happens, even if it's truncated and, and cabined all together. But this is one of the really good movies about the personal injury world and um, how to try a case. Yeah, and then just... Is that it? I guess just wrap it up from there. Oh. Thank you, you know, guys, for watching today. Follow, subscribe, look for our social media down in the description. Thank you, everybody, for watching this. We're getting a lot of good feedback, especially about these types of videos. So if you have some ideas about other movies you've seen or other things involving the law that you want us to uh, take a look at and give you our comments, we're happy to do so. Drop some comments below. Stay tuned for more. Thank you.